Today's uh, tour portion is called Shaft Team, and it is the word judges. Going from the first verse of the Torah portion in verse 18 of Deuteronomy 16. So, if you want to turn over there as it filled the, the blessing of reading that to us this morning. So, go ahead and turn over there and uh, we'll share in that. But before we do, I'm going to ask you a pretty challenging question, a very serious question, in all honesty. The question is this, how many of you truly believe in the Torah and desire to implement it in their lives and follow it all their days? That's, that's a big question, don't, don't, don't raise your hands glibly, because I'm going to really, I'm going to challenge you this morning, all right? I really am going to seriously challenge you. I'm going to put that yes to the test. So think about it. Don't raise your hands because I'm going to ask you something that is very important today. And I'm not joking either. We're going to have an exercise that I want you to do in sincerity with the highest of integrity. Last week, we shared about the blessings and cursings spoken as the children of Israel entered the land in the valley of Gilgal near Shechem. Some were placed on Mount Ebal to do the cursings and some on Mount Gerizim to do the blessings. Everybody remember that from last week in our discussion of that in teaching? Now, I'm going to state some commands of Yehovah and you are going to be the congregation of Israel. Your responsibility is to say amen. But I don't want you to do it unless you mean it. Because in doing it, if you mean it sincerity, it's a oath. It's a vow. Because the term amen, in case you never understood that, means so be it. Meaning, I will do it in essence. We're going to be, I'm going to be reading out of Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 9 through 26. So I'm not just pulling these out of thin air. But I... As I was studying, this was not where I was planning on going, and this was actually brought to my attention. And I was like, okay, that connects last week to this week, even though it's a future Torah portion. But I want to read it. And I'm going to say things, and your response, if you truly believe the Torah in your life, is to say amen. But I don't want to put anybody on the spot. This is not, I'm being serious. If you believe in the Torah, this is a serious time. Because these are things that are found in the Torah. And if we truly believe in the Torah, then these are things we should unequivocally say amen to. In all sincerity of heart. In verse 9 it says, Then Moses and the priests, the Levites, spoke to all Israel, saying, Take heed and listen, O Israel. This day you have become the people of Jehovah your Elohim. Wait a minute, I thought they already did that at Mount Sinai. Oh, guess what? All the people at Mount Sinai died, didn't they? So this is the next generation that's doing it. And Moses says, you're the next generation that's going to be the children of Israel. And I'm seeing around us today, the next generation that's going to be the children of Israel. Therefore, verse 10, you shall obey the voice of Jehovah your Elohim and observe his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. And Moses commanded the people on the same day, saying, These shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. When you have crossed over the Jordan, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin, and these shall stand on Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak with a loud voice and say to all the men of Israel the following things. Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image, an abomination to Jehovah, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and sets it up in secret. 
And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who moves his neighbor's landmark. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who makes the blind to wander off the road. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who perverts the justice due the stranger, the fatherless, and widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his father's wife because he has uncovered his father's bed. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with any kind of animal. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his mother-in-law. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who attacks his neighbor secretly. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who takes a bribe to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this Torah. And all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Those are powerful statements. And I know probably some of them were like, well, that doesn't affect me. But I was challenged as I was reading through them and studying how many of those things are being glorified today in our society. Things that would have been appalling in my early years of my life, but are now not only of not appalling, but are rejoice and looked upon with pleasure and joy. So much the difference between our society and our culture today and the words of Yehovah as seen in his scripture. As we look at today's passage of scripture in this Torah portion, I was going through it as I studied I'm just amazed at how many different things that are brought into the attention of the reader deal with justice. And they are separated in different ways, but I found at least seven different categories of things in today's Torah portion dealing with justice. And I want to go through those today, and I will try to be as fast as I possibly can, seeing as the time has come up. The first thing that we see in a, you're holding Yehovah's Torah through justice is the appointment of judges. Down there in the bottom of 16, chapter 16, verses 18 through 20, it says, You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates, which Yehovah your Elohim gives you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just, just judgment. So we see there the core thing that was talked about there is gates. Okay, if you look throughout Scripture, you'll see a lot about gates. All right, gates come in all shapes and sizes. If you look back in, in most you know ancient cultures and stuff, you'll see walled cities, and every walled city has at least one gate, right? Because you have to get into the wall somehow. But that wall is there to keep people out, isn't it? The enemy, the bad guys are out. <clears throat> And the gate is there as the one access point that people can go in and out from the city. But that allows for control of who can come in and go, doesn't it? And the city and those in the city have the responsibility to control and not allow those in that can harm the inhabitants of the city, right? So when you think of gates, gates became a place where several things happened. The first mention in the scriptures is Lot sitting at the gate when the angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot was there because he was seen as a prominent person, shall we say, a politician of the city at that point in time. And that was where you would go to discuss business, where you would go to declare judgments on people in cases, and where you would go to deal with punishment for people who had done criminal activity. And so judges were at the gates because the gate was the place where everybody came and went through of a city. Town meetings were held at the gates. So if you wanted the, the Jerusalem Gazette, 
and find out what was going on, the latest hula blue in Israel, you went to the gates to find out what was going on because that is where the person who had that information would be sharing it. So gates were a place of judgment, public meetings, a place of authority. It was where news was spread. In the scripture, it talks about the fact of, of controlling the gates of one's enemies. That was part of the blessing, one of the blessings that uh, Jacob placed, uh, was placed upon um, Jacob and his descendants in Genesis 22. And so when we look at that, what does that mean? To be in control of the gates of your enemies. That is a metaphor for those being con that you are a conqueror of your enemies. Because if you control their gates, that means you control the city and you have defeated your enemies. In Ruth chapter 4, we're talked about the fact that Boaz, in order to claim Ruth as his wife, had to go to the gates there to relate to the elders of the city. And because he was not the one who was first in line as the kinsman redeemer, had to go first and ask if the true kinsman redeemer before the judges there at the gate wanted to take Ruth. And of course the whole situation comes about that that guy decides not to. And so therefore Boaz says, I will step up and be the kinsman redeemer. And, a bit, and he eventually marries Ruth and brings her into the children of Israel. Parents of a rebellious son were told to bring him to the city gate where the elders would examine the evidence and pass judgment on whether this child was to be executed by stoning. All these things happened at the city gates. Proverbs chapter 31, uh, we, we often have that as a blessing for our wives and the mothers, and we do that as part of our Arab Shabbat meal. And as part of that, it says that she, her work is such that her husband is known in the city gates and is a part of the city gates, meaning her work and her help with him has made him so exalted and known that he is a leader and a judge in the city that they're a part of. And so we see the value and the importance, in, in especially in, throughout history, of gates and also biblically. The, re, the thing that is talked about there is it says that these judges shall judge the people with just judgment. Just judgment. That sounds kind of a, a double thing, doesn't it? Just judgment, same thing repeated twice. It actually is two different words in the Hebrew. Just, or justice, if we were to pull it out into a little bit different uh, conjugation, is the word zedek, which means righteous, or shall we say right. So when we say that God is righteous, we're saying that God is right. Think about that. God is right. So if God is right, and God says something, then what we are saying is that if something is in opposition to God and what he says, then it is what? Everybody. Wrong, right? The next word there, judgment, is mishpat. And actually has the concept of judgment or making a decision in a case. A verdict is given down. A litigation has happened before judges. In the scripture, we are told that Yehovah is a just Elohim or a just God. He seeks justice for his people. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 and 4, it says, For I proclaim the name of Yehovah, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. There's that idea of righteous. Perfect. A little bit different word, though. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth and with and without injustice righteous and upright is he so we see there in that passage that uh, that's part of the, uh, the the song of Moses I knew uh, I don't know if you how many of you know Carmen the singer mm -hmm. yeah and uh, why not um, what is the song war is it called war yeah. 
the one that's a boxing match between Satan and, and Yeshua that goes on. And uh, he says that we're going to be singing the song of Moses on David's harp. You know, as part of that, you know, he loves to bring all these metaphors and stuff in his music. But I was like the only thing I knew of the song of Moses growing up. But as, you know, of course, studying and understanding the Torah portions, that's become much greater in the understanding that there was an actual song that he's talking about that Moses sang. And this is part of it, that for I proclaim the name of Yehovah, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice. A God of truth without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. And understanding, so if you say, I believe in Torah, you're saying, I believe all those things. Because all those things pretty much sum up the Torah and are part of the Torah itself in the book of Deuteronomy. There are like two chapters, I think, before the end of Deuteronomy, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head. So when God says something, that is justice. He's a God of truth without injustice. So anything that goes against his Torah then has to be what? Injustice. Falsehood. Not truth. Psalm 58, verses 10 and 11. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. So that men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely he is God who judges the earth. I just, I mean, it's mind-boggling as my wife was sharing early on when we were singing. The lack of any care that we have in Christianity as a whole for justice. I struggle and have struggled for years now as I've studied the scriptures and and delved into Torah, the lack of understanding of justice. And I think it shows that after years of that being deluding, happening in our culture, we're to the point that we're at where justice or injustice is called justice and justice is called injustice. Scripture talks over and over again about God's justice. And unfortunately, Christianity uses one word and and pretty much one word only, and that's all they talk about, especially today, and that's grace. But you can't have grace without justice. Anybody disagree with me? How do you know the person is having grace if justice is never accomplished? Grace becomes a pointless word unless justice is first understood and follow through with. If as my children are growing up, all I do is show grace every time that they disobey, what does my word become? Do I have any truth in me? If I say to my kids, kids, uh, stealing is wrong, and my kids steal, and I go, you stole, it's okay. I will forgive you. We go on. They still again. It's okay. I forgive you. Go on. What am I telling my children in actuality? I'm telling them that stealing is right. And that me saying stealing is wrong is actually false, not true. And so I create in my children a falsehood and and basically a life against their creator who says that that is wrong. Psalm 116, verse 5. Gracious is Jehovah and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. I put that in there as the last thing because of the fact that it does say our God is merciful. He is merciful. And whether we, why I stress justice, I do not want to deny mercy and grace. But mercy and grace, again, is only seen if justice is preeminent. Without justice, mercy becomes frivolous. If we all run around and God is giving out, you did great, you gave it your effort, uh, trophies to everyone, how do we really know what truth and where he really wants us to be is at? You know? And I use that as an analogy to our current culture. We give everybody a trophy for saying, you tried. 
But if it didn't succeed, you didn't succeed. And if we don't attain to the goal, if we don't attain, as Paul says, to perfection, to completion, then our, is God pleased with us? I know we're all running a race, and I know that we're all striving. And the goal is to keep striving, folks. We don't get a you tried, and then that's it. All right? That's not what Paul is saying. And no part of Scripture is saying that either, even though it seems that's what modern Christianity tends to say. Verses go on and it says that if we live in his righteousness, we are safe. Now the one who's speaking this is David. Did David face unsafe things? Amen? Yet in Psalm 118 verse 6 it says, Jehovah is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can man do to you? And what can man do to I? Or to me? Depending on my proper grammar there. What can man do to me? Can he take this life? Yeah. Can he make me miserable? Yeah. yeah. But what's the ultimate objective? Is the ultimate objective this life? If this is all we have, the Apostle Paul says this, that we are of most people to be it's despaired and um, that's not the word I'm thinking of, but uh, not envied, but uh, huh? pity. Thank you. Thank you. We're to be the most pitied of all people because our lives are worthless. But that's not what our goal is. If he gave everything he had, took the beatings and the, the persecutions and the stoning to death that God re resurrected his life back to, and all the things that he went through, the imprisonments. If it wasn't for something greater than this life, he's to be the most pitied. But they can take his body, they can take his soul, or not his soul, but his, his life and his eyes and any part of him. And he understood that there is a greater goal than this life. Justice will be made. When we look around in our world today and we see the world falling apart before our very eyes on a global setting, we can rest assured that justice will be made. Yehovah desired a system of justice that would preserve his commands no matter what. That would be filled with men of integrity that would rule in his authority with impartiality. That's what he desired for his people. For his nation. Life Application Study Bible says these verses anticipated a great problem the Israelites would face when they arrived in the promised land. Although they had Joshua as their national leader, they failed to complete the task and choose other spiritual leaders who would lead the tribes, districts, and cities with justice and God's wisdom. Because they did not appoint wise judges and faithful administrators, Rebellion and injustice plague their communities. It is a serious responsibility to appoint or elect wise and just officials. In your sphere of influence, home, church, school, job, are you ensuring that justice and godliness prevail? Failing to choose leaders who uphold justice can lead to much trouble as Israel would discover. So God is a God of justice. And in the, one of the first things he was doing was appointing judges over his people and saying, it is a good thing. From what I know, from what I've studied in my past, the founding fathers based our judicial system upon God's judicial system. You know, the whole tens, fifties, hundreds, five hundreds, the goal of what they chose to do was to create a system where there was layers of judgment. So the earth, simple things went to the first people, the harder things went a little bit further, the greater things went further until it, of course, got the Supreme Court, which is not the priesthood in God's tabernacle, I will say that, even though some probably think of that today. But 
it was a good human concept that was trying to pattern after God's truth. And God, and God set this up. And so I, you know, I appreciate and applaud the try that our founding fathers did in this country. And I think for the greater part of this 200 and 300, almost 300 years now, our, it has served our country quite well. And if, especially if you look at it compared to other countries in the world, we had a lot of times just godly, impartial judges. And when that happened, our country overall did pretty good. But when impartial and ungodly and unbiblical judges came into play, what has happened to our judicial system? And how has that affected every other part of our government and our culture? The next thing we see in this chapter is in the next couple of verses, don't allow for the perversion of justice. Deuteronomy 16, 19, 20. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show impartiality, nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall, not, you shall follow what is an altogether just, that you must live and inherit the land which Jehovah your Elohim is giving you. <clears throat> the term rest in, in, the, in the King James or pervert is here in the New King James is the Hebrew word natah. And it means to stretch out or bend or bow something. You know, you think of a bow that's bent in order to apply the string that gives it its um, its springiness that will shoot the arrow, okay? And what it's saying in, the, in essence there, the natah is do not bend your verdicts to the person you want it to go to. Do not bend your verdicts to the person that you like. We, used to, we, had a, we have a company in, in uh, Perry a few years back when they were redoing the uh, I-69 and they, they got the license to do all the rock crushing. Well, in the city of Perry, that wasn't allowed. And I should say there was, we had a, a gravel pit with some ordinances that dealt with that. But we didn't have anything specific for rock crushing within the city. Although it was pretty hard and fast. And so they tried everything they possibly could to be able to do the rock crushing within the city limits. And you can imagine this really loud people's houses across the street couldn't hear because it was so loud. Not a good thing inside of a city limits. They went so far as we, because we were finding them and we were saying, no, you're not going to do this and we're taking you to court over this. They went so far as to, at the same time that this was going on, we had this uh, historic house called the McQueen House. And the, the Historic Society of Perry, uh, like six people, wanted to restore this house. And they needed like $30,000 to do it. And you're looking going, we don't have 30000 to do it. So they had this great idea. Well, you know what? They came to uh, some of our council members and our mayor and said, we will provide the funds for the fixing up of the house if you let us do the rock crushing. That's a bribe. And the goal is that the people who were in charge that had the responsibility would turn their eye towards that person and not towards following what was just. Many of us don't do this, or, um, sorry. Many of us obviously aren't involved in government. We don't see these things, we aren't doing these things like the Mosers were trying to do the city council of Perry. But do we do these things in other things in our lives, our jobs, in our families, in our homes, with our neighbors? One way many of us have or will have the responsibility is within the confines of our family. As parents, we are to be judges of our family. Do we uphold justice within our family? I'm going to go in. I was going to go in here this real quick and talk about the fact that as parents, we have the right to uphold justice. I get really internally angry at parents who don't hold justice as valuable within their families. 
I get really, really, really upset when I see a child do something against another child that's wrong and the parents blow it off and act like the kid who, who got affected by it is the one in the wrong and say, well, you need to buck up. It's, you're just feeling, you know, quit being such a silly boy or a sissy. And they say things like that. And so again, what are we teaching? That you do wrong to someone else, you be a bully and it's okay. That's unbiblical. And yet our world today and our culture is full of this type of stuff. As parents, we are supposed to be judges of justice and righteousness. And when we see a child do wrong, we got to get off our lazy derrieres, go over and deal with the situation accordingly. Which sometimes means we have to personally turn off the TV and get up and go do that. Which isn't always easy, is it? But I'll tell you what, when you do it, it becomes easier later on. Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8 says, what, With what shall I come before Jehovah and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will Jehovah be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil, Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of the, my body for the sin of my soul? Mike is asking this of his people. Is this what God wants? Is this his justice? Is all these things? Can I buy righteousness? And I think, unfortunately, Christianity has told people a lie for several hundred years at least and saying, you can buy justice. You can buy redemption of your sins, or shall I say, you can buy grace. I mean, one simple thing is if I do a rosary, am I buying grace? If I light a candle, I mean, those are simple. Those are Roman Catholic people who don't understand those things. Evangelicals aren't much better. We just think we're more spiritual. He goes on and says, He has shown me, O oh man, what is good and what does Jehovah require of you but to do justice, to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Yes, mercy is included. But if you remember, the first one is justice. Again, justice, mercy without justice is nothing. Third thing we see is in this passage of scripture in this Torah portion that deals with justice is go to the place that Jehovah chooses to place his name for the priests, the Levites, and judges there and bring any case that is too difficult to judge and accept their judgment. In Deuteronomy 17, verses 8 through 13, it talks about this. <clears throat> and it says, now... You're going to go through and they're supposed to bring it before these priests, Levites, and judges. And, and that, so judges first, if they can't figure it out, they go to higher judges, next judges. If they can't figure it out, they toss it up further. It goes to the priests and the Levites at the temple. And that was the ultimate, that was the supreme court of the children of Israel. All right? So the priest, you got to the priest and, and you've gone up there and you're like, oh good, I finally got to the priest. I'm in front of God himself here in his tabernacle. I'm going to get justice. And you lay out your cases, you and your friend uh, your, or neighbor. And the, the priest looks at it, looks on all the evidence and says, I find for your neighbor. What do you do? Do you go, ah, that's a terrible call. You don't know justice. Come on, who do you think you are? That's a terrible judgment. You should have favored in me instead of him. Do we ever hear that? If we look down further in that last section, it says, Now the man who acts presumptuously and will not heed the priest who stands to minister there before Jehovah your Elohim, or the judge, that man shall die. Wow. That, you know, how many people don't truck, don't care about justice in our country and don't care what just judges do or anything like that? If you had a death penalty for defying judges' authority 
or people in authority, would that change how we act? I think so. And he says there, Moses says to the children of Israel, so you shall put away the evil from Israel, and all the people shall hear and fear and no longer act presumptuously. How many of you think that we have presumptuous litigation in our country now? Yes. Why do we have presumptuous litigation, folks? Is it because judges do not act in integrity and judge accordingly? Do we always go most of the time with those who are in litigious, the ones bringing the litigation forward? And so people have learned, I can just, hey, you know, I spill coffee on myself and burn myself and I can go and sue for $3 million and I'm going to get it. Well, hey, next person up. Who's my $3, $3 million payday, you know? And what does that do for our culture and our economy? It brings it down. Who gets to pay for that $3 million that that judge just awarded somebody for nothing? For their own stupidity. How many of you ever spilled something on yourself and burned yourself pretty bad? You know? So, did you ever go and say, I need $3 million for that? Why? Because I'm the dummy, you know? I'm the one that did it. For whatever reason, I did it. I don't deserve $3 million for my stupidity. But that's what our culture is becoming. Is it not? So Yah and his infinite wisdom said, well, you know, if the judge comes, I mean, and I'm the judges I know were the one that did this. And this case was won and it was settled. But I don't think those people were acting out of integrity and honor to God and his commands. God would say, if you're going to stick a cup between your legs and spill it and burn yourself, that's on you. That's not the responsibility of the company that, paid, that gave you the hot coffee. <clears throat> so go to the place Jehovah chooses for his name. It's interesting to me that God says specifically, I'm putting in charge certain people. And these are the people in, in order. Did that always, did the people like those people? Did they always appreciate that God placed people over them? Now we have a dichotomy here, don't we, folks? On one hand, we got bad judges and bad priests and bad Levites. But over here, we have people that refuse to follow good judges and good Levites and good priests, right? And God, But God set up the system... And now, what are we supposed to do? You know, on one hand, we look at the Levites, and there's a section here that talks about taking care of the Levites and the priests. So I'm not really going to go over that much, but to say this one thing. Bad Levites, when the people stopped coming and listening and going to the temple and the tabernacle, said, okay, you're not paying us, so I'm going to go over and start being the pri a priest and a Levite for the pagan gods. And they started leading the people into... Baal worship and against God. Then you had the other ones, the good ones, who stayed there and said to try to fight to keep the temple and the tabernacle open, and the people were like, I don't want to listen to that God anymore. And eventually, they couldn't pay for their families to survive. And so they boarded up the tabernacle and left to go to the homes where they could get jobs to pay for their family. So God says, take care of those who are in leadership over you That's right. Amen. and support them. Paul, no, it's not Paul. Yes, I think it is Paul. Forgive me if it's not off the top of my head. He says, do not muzzle the ox. Is not the elder worthy of his wages? You know, that's Paul, not, not Moses, you know, not Eli or Elijah saying it's Paul and the and who's he's starting up congregations and saying here's elders here's leaders pay for them to be good leaders because otherwise eventually you get only bad leaders and now what are they going to get paid for to lead you away from God and we see that all throughout Christianity cities of refuge Cities of refuge were set up as places where you could go if you had done something. Mainly it was manslaughter. If you accidentally killed somebody, then you would run to a city of refuge. And then you're in the city of refuge, 
you cannot be executed. If you were, then the person who was the one who did it would also be executed. It was a capital crime to kill someone in a city of refuge. And you would stay there until you got your case heard, and it would be brought before judges in the city of refuge. And if they favored the other person, then you were executed. But if they favored you, then you were free. You were no longer able to be executed, but you had to stay within the city of refuge until the current sitting high priest died. That's always a, a little tricky thing there. I don't really understand why is he not free, but I'm assuming something along the lines that if you went back home and it didn't get back to them, that you were free or something, that maybe you could be killed by somebody else. I'm just saying that that was probably your best bet to make sure that you stayed alive. Kind of an idea. But it all deals with justice. Property boundaries. Last one I'm going to do here. Guys, it's really late. Deuteronomy 19, verse 14. You should not remove your neighbor's landmark, landmark which the men of old have set, and your inheritance which you will inherit in the land that Yehovah your Elohim is giving you to possess. <clears throat> so moving a boundary is in essence theft or stealing. All right, because what you're doing is you're stealing property from somebody. How many of you know like the new modern like movable electric fences that people use for like chickens and goats and stuff like that and you can really quickly pick them up and maneuver them around to recorral and change where they're at for their pasture land and stuff people know what i'm talking about you know well <clears throat> imagine that but the person using that in order to go around your goats and bring them over into their pasture that would be pretty naughty wouldn't it you wouldn't like that would you very much all those goats that you've trained and raised and and paid for and hope to get milk and other things from, you would not like someone coming and doing that. Well, that's in essence the idea of, of and happened with these property boundaries. People would actually maneuver the stones so that your property was now part of their property. This example of stealing and theft relies upon the people there being honest and having integrity and not moving those stones. And so we see a direct correlation between the maneuvering of boundaries and self-control. Yehovah, Yehovah expects his people to have mastery over our lives and in so doing show honor and love to our neighbor. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, the Paul says, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. In essence, what Paul is saying is, I have trained my body not to move boundaries. Boundaries that God has placed around my life, according to his Torah. I'm not going to move those boundaries. I'm not going to allow other things, like I'm going to theft God by trying to include the things of this world into my life. It's a perfect example, though, of how we show love for our neighbors. Through teaching self-control to ourselves and our children, we show love for our neighbors. Uh, from gotquestions.org, it's a Christian website. They actually had some pretty good things on this section. It said, proper boundaries aid believers in keeping out worldly influences. Children of the light have no fellowship with darkness and are thus separate from the world. Being kind and friendly is Christ-like, but we are not to embrace the world's way of doing things. Our wish, our wish is not to keep people away, but when people are being destructive, the boundaries we set can limit the evil they commit against us. Boundaries are about taking responsibility for our own lives. God gives us freedom to choose to live within his boundaries or outside of them. And to live outside of God's boundaries means to accept the consequences. So we see that the concept of boundaries is very important to the life of a believer. God places boundaries in order to help us, to give us structure in our lives. The Torah is meant to be that type of a structure. 
It's an economy that we can live in and thrive in if we seek to do it according to God's commands. If we are always seeking to try and move the fence or move the boundaries and get outside, then we will fail to see the joy and the, and the fruitfulness of living out Torah in our hearts and in our lives. When we live within those boundaries, God is capable of blessing us, making us fruitful and multiplying us. And so we see not all the things that I have hoped to do today due to time, but we can see many instances of justice just in this one section of Judges, of Shaptim, of how God hoped his people would trust him and live within his boundaries and therefore would see the glory and the benefit and the blessing of walking in his ways, not the ways of the world. Shabbat shalom.